hello and a very warm welcome to today's session this is weekly current affairs and this is miscellaneous topics of saturday so today we'll be taking up articles that are related with respect to the criminal procedure amendment act which has been enacted and passed by the parliament and from august 4th onwards this is in application and the next article that we'll be taking up is regarding the coastal erosions after that we'll also take up articles regarding the coastal regulation zones as well as eco sensitive zones as well and also the essential commodities act so these are the articles which have been in news in the last one week so let's start this session and our first article for today is the what is the criminal procedure identification act of 2022 so recently the parliament has passed this act after so much of tussle and this act is now enacted right firstly before we start to understand this article you need to understand the applications of this particular article with respect to our examination for that let's quickly see where exactly this article falls into we have a preliminary examination syllabus in the indian polity which talks about that government policies and interventions for development in various sectors and issues arising out of their design and implementation matlab agar koi bhi act bana diya gaya that act will have certain issues and implementational problems and the interventions that this act takes into so let us quickly deal with this what what do as an ideal aspirant we have to take this article number 1 see we have to know about the criminal procedure identification act the key provisions in this is and if at all an act is amended you should also know about what exactly is it amended from which act right that also we are going to take up and we should also deal with the right to privacy which was in news and in relation to this act and the next component which will be taking up is it is talked about the equality component of an individual when this act has been enacted and the article 14 that has also been questioned and the next article that deals with this is the article number 20 how is article 20 it is said that the abridgement of article 20 which is a fundamental right with this, with this act enactment and nextly we'll also be understanding some of the contemporary laws which are also talks about the identification of the prisoner so under various dimensions let us explore this article before we start with this article i wanted to give you a brief idea about what does this article talk about see this is an article which says that identification of the criminal procedures that means if you have done a crime it is very difficult for the police to identify did you really do this crime or not for this there need to be some technological advancement and technological data to prove that that you have done this crime and the society's wrongs the society's wrongs can be of two different types one a wrong that can be done in a private space between two individuals and a wrong that this particular wrong will impact the society now for example you have a rental agreement and this rental agreement there is some kind of breaching of this rental agreement between you and your owner now what kind of this wrong can be considered into this wrong is a civil wrong theek hai wrongs in the society jo hota hai na wrongs in the society it can be of civil in nature and it can be criminal in nature now what is the difference between civil wrong and a criminal wrong here you have to understand that a criminal wrong when it is done it will impact the society right and also it is generally understood that if at all you do some kind of wrong and it is the duty of the government to protect this person from doing further further wrongs right so these kind of activities are considered to be criminal some kind of violence and other harmful activities which can impact the society and lead the society in a wrong path now when it comes to civil activities civil activities are petty activities where a crime kind of related activities are not involved in simple terms a relation between you and your tenant and a owner where some kind of misagreements happen that is your civil law so the current act which talks about criminal procedure identification act that means the amendment has been done under this category right so if person a has committed a crime and this person has been accused accused by person b that a has done a 
wrong. A has done a wrong, only an accused, it is, he is, this person is only an accused person. Now, when this accused person is further taken by the police and, and arrested, now this Criminal Procedure Amendment Act says that biological as well as physical samples can be collected from this person, right. Now, this is what is your Criminal Procedure Identification Act, which was earlier called as the Identification of Prisoners Act. Okay. There was an act which was once called Identification of You see, the first act that talks about is the Identification of Prisoners Act. Now, this Identification of Prisoners Act talks about this was enacted in 1920. Now, we have an act named Criminal Procedure Identification Act. It is the same act with additional advancements and introduction of technology related biological sample collection and physical sample collections. So, if you have watched any movies which are related to the crime, earlier the movies always look forward for the fingerprints, right? Agar aapne crime kiya hoga, you might have left over some kind of evidences. Now, these evidences are generally collected by the police and they have been, they will be produced in the court. So, on a similar lines, now the police has wider ambit to collect the samples. So, earlier under the, just a minute, earlier under the identification of the prisoners act, this act says that you can collect samples such as number one, that is your hand fingerprints. You can collect fingerprints of an individual, you can also collect toe prints. Right. These are some of the basic elements that have been covered under the Act. Let me show you here. So, back in 1920 Act, this Act says that you can collect either fingerprints of an individual or footprints or else photographs of an individual. But now, after the amendment of this Act, which has been enacted, which says that you can also collect the biological samples and you can do their analysis. You can also collect their biological samples. Now, what are these biological samples? Today, you have your Aadhaar card. If you have to get your Aadhaar card, you have to give your iris scan. That means your retinal identity as well as thumb impressions, right? Now, these are some of the biological samples that can be collected. Along with that, an individual's semen also can be collected. Individual's blood is also collected and swabs that can be analyzed for DNA profiling also. Now, this particular part which talks about the collection of samples here. Now, this collection of samples, it is said that it is abridging the article 21 of an individual, right? Article 21 of an individual. Article 21 of an individual says that right to life and personal liberty except according to the procedure established by law. And there is a case called Puttaswami case which, is, which says that right to privacy is your fundamental right and it is part of your right to life. So, the right to privacy, which is also a fundamental right, will now be abridged by taking the samples for through these manners. See, for example, you just imagine you are driving a car and you have broken the signal, right? You will generally be fined by 1000 rupees or fine odd. But if at all the police wants to take you to the police station, that means he can arrest you. Though it is a non-cognizable offence, the, the police can arrest you. Now, when a person is arrested, that person's samples can be taken. Now, imagine for a petty crime, for a small crime, if that person's data is collected, either the fingerprints or the iris scan or any other data which is presented here, don't you think that there is an abridgement of the privacy? Now, this is some of the questions that have been in consideration while dealing with this act. Now, whose samples need to be collected? Who can collect these samples? These are some of the debates that are running under this act. Firstly, under the 1920 act, earlier this act says that a sample can be collected of either fingerprints, footprints or photographs. Now, it has been widened. Earlier, these three samples could have been collected only by the officer of minimum of sub-inspector level or inspector of the station. Now, these samples can be collected even by the head constable also. So, for suppose, just imagine, we generally trust an officer who has authority in their hand. 
you won't like to give some kind of your samples or you don't like to give your samples of any biological samples to a officer of a lower grade or a person of a lower grade who is part of a government because the trust factor is always low. This is what is conceived by the National Crime Reports Bureau. So, you yourself check for you, check for yourself that if you wanted to give your credentials to a district magistrate, you always will, you will be in a willing position that you will be having that confidence that, okay, this data is safe with that person. But if you wanted to give to a village revenue officer, would you think, would you, would you have the same kind of trust factor in them? Now, here comes the question again. So, these are some of the aspects. So, as said that earlier in the 1920, a person who is convicted or a person who is arrested for offences of punishable with rigorous imprisonment of one year or more, these kind of people samples have been collected. But now, either a person who is arrested or a person who is convicted or even an accused person, accused person. Now, we have to understand the difference between three different terms. See, a person is generally considered to be accused. Number one, accused. Accused is nothing but you generally allege someone that this person has done a crime. Under that conditions, you call that person as accused, A1, A2. So, the court will not say that this person has committed a crime because there is a trial that is going on. Until the trial has finished and the court gives the judgment that this person has done a crime or not done a crime, if at all this a person does crime, then the person is said to be convicted and then a procedure of jail term will be awarded to him. So, but a person who is accused and after 5 to 6 years, then it is said that this person has not done any wrong, then he will be just an accused person who got acquittal, right. Now, even the accused person's data can also be collected and arrested persons, arrested. Now, arrested means an arrest can be done in two different ways, one through a warranty, one without a warranty. So, if at all a person who is arrested for petty reasons, if their data has to be collected, how can that be justified is the debate of this particular act. Now, an arrest an arrest can be done through a warrant or without a warrant. So, without a warrant is generally for those crimes where the crime is said to be of a higher level. If the crime is of a greater level or higher level, very bad crimes, then that person can be arrested without a warrant. But if a person does a petty crimes for that, they need to have a warrant, right. Now, this kind of scenarios will also lead to the confusion of this act, right. Now, if you see a person who is under the preventive detention, their samples can also be collected. Now, who has the authority to say that do not collect this person sample or collect this person sample for the crime which you have done? Now, it is generally the magistrate, okay? not just an arrested person to aid the legislation investigation. Now, it is a magistrate who decides if not to be collected that persons, it is to be decided by the magistrate. In the earlier case, it said that magistrate may order in other cases collection from any arrested person to aid criminal investigation, right. Now, these are some things which have been mentioned in this act in a clear cut manner. And the next provisions are persons who may require or direct collection of data. It means that who has the authority to collect? I have already said that it is generally investigating officer that means a sub inspector level or an investigating officer of the inspector level earlier they used to collect the samples. Now, even the samples can even be collected by a head ward of a prison, warden of a prison or even the head constable of that particular station, right. Apart from that, the metropolitan magistrate or the judicial magistrate of first class in case of persons required to maintain good behavior or peace, the executive magistrate. Okay. Earlier it was only magistrate. Now, in simple terms, it has the scope of this particular act has widened the scope of the police to collect the samples. Now, why do we need this act in first place? It is because the rationality given by the government for the for framing of this act is that, see, the act of prisoner's identification bill or the act, it has been made way back in the year 1920. The technological advancement back then were different. Mostly, the advancement was only through the fingerprints, that was the innovation that we had. And also, 
we used to have photographs cameras were also very new then photographs were there and then toe, pr toe prints and fingerprints now with the advancement of the technology today we have dna samples today we have iris scan that we use it for aadhar cards it is said that why can't we use this technological advancements in identification of the criminals right now this is what the rationality which has been given by the government and of course these kind of interventions and these kind of innovations are definitely necessary to catch the criminals at a faster rate now everyone knows that the speedy trial of a, any kind any case will on an average today the judiciary is taking somewhere around 3 to 4 years for disposable of a normal case right and you might know that the functioning of the judiciary is always complained that it is very very slow see the functioning of a judiciary is slow because there is a big procedure that is involved that means it is actually the functioning of the police or the trial that is slow that is the reason why the functioning of the judiciary is also slow it is because if at all a person does a crime for the crime need to be proved by the police they have to undergo and travel various places collect evidences and the case need to be built in a very strong proof manner on the other side the same accused person is also given an opportunity to prove that he is not guilty so in this due process the process for acquittal or the process for conviction of an individual is always delayed in the court so the brunt is always faced by the judiciary not by the police department because we see the case in the judiciary and it is generally understood that the time jo hota hai na kafi lambe time lagta hai to dispose of one particular case but the actual reason for the disposal of delayed disposal of disposable of this case is that there is a procedural delay with respect to the police in their investigation and the reports that have been submitted now the government wants to enhance the procedural methods so that if we can use more data if we can bring up the more samples it will be very easy for the government also to take care of the criminals and identify them and punish as early as possible right now let's look into the rationality of the government in enacting this act it says that with the use of identification details in criminal trials trials the measurements and photographs for identification have three main purposes the first purpose purpose says that firstly it talks about identity it talks about identity now it is the duty of the police department to identify who has committed a crime right it is the duty of the police department to identify who has committed a crime now in this procedure it is very easy for the police if they have hair samples if they also have other biological samples fingerprints and the record that national crime records bureau keeps with the larger database so it will be very easy nextly it talks about to identify suspected repetition of the crimes or the offenses by the same person so in general it is considered that if at all a person does a crime with respect to i am talking about criminal not about civil offenses their attitudes are trained in such a way they are trained to do the same or similar modus operandi crimes again and again right that is the reason why the government always go and search for people who does this repeated offenses now it will be very easy for the government especially the ministry of home police department to identify these kind of repeated offenders right and by this sample collection or the data advancement they can easily establish a relationship between a person who have committed a crime earlier and with the same modus operandi a similar crime has also been conducted elsewhere they can easily correlate between these two crimes so generally a crime it is said that the criminal will always have a signature in doing their crimes so those kind of signature methods are called modus operandi for example there is a theft in your home and that theft if it is done in a one particular manner and a similar kind of threat theft has also happened in few villages far away from your home or few cities far away from your home it is generally understood that it is the same persons or the same connected groups might have done the similar kind of crime in a different city now it will be very easy for the police department if at all they get a hair samples in that home if at all they have some kind of saliva samples or any biological samples which they have left so it will be very easy if they have similar samples here and similar samples there or if at all any cctv footage so the crime identification and the procurement of information today it is very very wide so one or the other way 
it is understood that the criminal can be caught very easily. Now, these are some of the rationalities that have been given by the government. Now, let us try to also look into the relationship between the National Crime Records Bureau. What is it? Why is this National Crime Records Bureau being authorized to store such kind of data? Suppose a person has committed a crime. Now, who will be storing the data of that particular person? It is the National Crime Records Bureau. So, here I wanted to ask you a question. Law and order is a state subject, right? Police is a state subject. Now, collection of the data of, of these criminals will be whose subject? Is it the state subject or the central subject? Suppose you do a crime and that crime falls into state subject or a central subject. Now, who has the authority to deal with this? Now, for all these problems, there is a single point solution that is National Crime Records Bureau under the Ministry of Home, which will keep the database of all the criminals who have been the, from where the samples have been collected. Right. It will share the data with the law enforcement agencies. The duty of this National Crime Records Bureau is to collect the data, store the data and also share the data to the law enforcement agencies. Now, these law enforcement agencies can be your enforcement directorate who also directly work with the criminals. National investigative agency bhi ho sakta hai. Dusra state ki police department ho sakta hai. So, these kind of bodies which are working in the states, they will be providing the samples. Now, for how long this sample will be stored? It is said that for 75 years, the sample need to be stored. Right. After 75 years, the sample can be disposed of. That means the collected data can be disposed of. Now, records will be disposed or discarded in case if a person has been accused and this person after 7 or 8 odd years, if the case has been said that, the judiciary says that this person is no longer an accused person, he is acquitted. Now, when that person is acquitted, that means the court says that this person did not do any crime and that case that particular samples which have been collected by the police department will also be discarded of, right? Clear? Now, this is the role of the National Crime Records Bureau. Now, the next problems, let us look into the problems that are associated with the this bill and also with respect to the Article 20, okay? I hope everyone knows what does Article 20 talks about and also about the Criminal Procedure Identification Act of 2022. It says that they can collect samples, right? Samples of biological samples and physical samples. Now, it is also said that there is a controversy that Article 21 also it can be abridged because right to privacy is a fundamental right which is given under the right to life, which is given under the Puttaswamy judgment. Now, let us see how is it going to infri in infringe the Article 20 of the Constitution of India, right? Now, the Article 20 of the Constitution of India has three parts, A, B and C. A says that ex post facto law, no ex post facto. See, ex post facto means suppose today there is an act that has been enacted. Now, the act will be applicable from today. Right, it will not be applicable before. Okay. Now, these kind of laws are called prospective laws. They are called as prospective laws. On a similar way, there can also be a retrospective act as well. Now, what do you mean by this retrospective act? It says that if at all there is an act that has been enacted today, it is applicable from now on for the future and also for the previous time also. So, usually the criminal laws are always ex post facto laws. If an act that is enacted today, from now on it will be applicable. The data cannot be collected for the previous criminals. Now, you understand there are thousands of people who are living in the jails, right? Their crime has been done earlier and this crime, they have been subject to the procedures of the 1920. Now, there is a controversy that Article 20 says that if at all the samples of these individuals need to be collected, how can this act be a post facto, right, ex post facto. So, can we collect these people's samples who have done the crime? Now, this is some kind of question that has been 
questioning by this particular act and the article 20 of the fundamental rights. Now there is an other provision that no double jeopardy. The second provision says that no double jeopardy. Now what do you mean by no double jeopardy? It simply says that for one crime you will be punished only once. You will not be punished again for the same crime, right? You will not be punished for the same crime twice. Now let us try to understand the case of the Criminal Procedure Identification Act. Suppose you are an individual and one of your neighbor has accused that you have done a crime. But no one knows whether you have done a crime or not done a crime, right? But police will arrest you and you will be subjected to the judiciary within 24 hours and the judiciary also feels that you are a possible threat or possible accused persons. Now you are one of the accused person. But when you are taken to the station, police station, now here you are just an accused. Okay. Accused are not meant that they are convicted, right? Or else you are arrested and taken to the police station for any crime under the preventive detention. That means there is a possibility that you may do a crime. Because of you, there can be a possibility of crime. So you will be taken to the police station and in the police station you say that I am not going to give my any of the samples. Okay. If you say that I am not going to give any of my samples, now the Criminal Procedure Identification Bill of 2022 says that if at all you deny this, part, this giving the samples to the station authority, then it will subjected to Indian Penal Code of Section 183. It says that it is also considered to be a crime. It is also considered to be a crime. Firstly, you have not done a crime and secondly, you are not, not you are in a position you are not in a position or you say that i am not going to give my samples when you say that you are not going to give your samples the police has the authority to take forcefully your samples by the criminal procedure identification act of 2022 and also you will be subjected to the crime that you did not give the samples when asked right maybe for the reason for which you are arrested after after an year after few months or after a few days, you have been said that this person is accused and this person is acquitted. Okay. That means you haven't done any wrong. Okay. You haven't done any wrong, but still, after four months or five months of some time, you have acquitted, but still, in the police station, you have denied giving your samples. That means this particular case can still run on you. Okay. Now this can be a double geo parody. That means you haven't done any kind of wrong things and still you have been subjected to one of the Indian Penal Code sections and you can be punished for not just not giving. Okay. This is some of the grey area which this act has to look forward into. And lastly, no self-incrimination is the concept of 23 subsection 3 which says that no self incrimination. So, here for this you have to understand the logic that hum itne sare data to collect kar rahe, right? We are collecting so much of data, but we have to understand that where are we going to store this data? Is this data so safe with us? So, usually you understand that the lockup dates that happens, that happens because of the no self incrimination concept. It means Lockup debts generally do accept when the person is not willing to accept that the, this person has done a crime. That is when the police generally subject that individual to harsh measures, third degree measures, which is illegal. So, it is generally assumed that no self incrimination is one of the reason why most of the lockup debts happen. Now, if at all the police wants to manipulate these kind of samples, it is very easy for them, right? Suppose you went to your friend's home and in the friend's home when you went there, you have combed your hair or you have done some another activity by where one of your biological or physical samples have been left behind. If at all, after five days, there is a crime that has been done in, your, in that home. So, maybe your samples have also been collected at that particular place. When you have been called to the station, there is clear cut evidence that your presence is there but you still deny that my presence is not there on that particular day. Now these kind of grey areas are left behind, then you will be subjected to one of the no self incrimination. That means you will be asked to approve or tell that that you have done a crime. 
Now these are some of the criticisms that have been enacted under this act. Okay. Yes, kafi sare criticisms which are being in use. Now these are some of the provisions which have been talking about the Criminal Procedure Identification Act which has already been established by on August 24th and it is in provisionally running. Right. So if you have any doubts regarding this, please post your questions in the comment section. We will be addressing these answers in the comment section itself. Right. This is what is about the Criminal Procedure Amendment Act. Now our next article which talks about the Chellanam's new tetrapod based seawall. See Chellanam is one of the place where the coastal erosion is every year very often. Right. Under this particular area it is generally said that the coastal erosion itna zada hai so they have come up with a solution. Now this kind of articles can be approached from disaster management also. It can be approached from the geographical point of view also how to stop the coastal erosion in India. See India is one of the largest coastal area, India has one of the largest coastal area. If you see we have more than 7000 kilometers of coastal area and there has been a report which said that out of the 7000, 6000 odd kilometers of the coastal area in India has been subjected to erosion. Now erosion and deposition are natural phenomena, there is nothing new with this. But we have to understand if particularly a particular place has been eroded here. Imagine this place has been eroded. The deposition will not take place at the same place the deposition might may take place at some other place right so erosion and deposition are the common phenomena but the rate at which they are eroding is something which is a problem so across the coastlines of india it is said that near about 60% of the total coastlines of india are eroded since last 1990s a lakar so it is very important to understand the erosional activities that are taking place in the coastal area and the steps that have been taken by the various coastal regulating areas so that they can prevent this coastal areas. Now what are the methods, what are the methodologies that have been used and some technical terms that to understand from the geogra geographical point of view, we will, be, we will be looking into these articles, right. Firstly see India has a large coastal area which starting from West Bengal to Laker, Gujarat tak, which is more than 7000 kilometers. And you should understand that the population across the world, the population across the world, 50% of the total global population lies across the coast. It is only near about 50% population lies within the interior of the continent. This is a global population. And if you look into the coastal areas of India, there are, there are different names for the different areas. The Gujarat coast has two different names. This is your Kutch coast and this is your Katiawar coast. Now from South of Gujarat till the south of Karnataka, the name of the coast for India is Konkan coast, which is also Goa is also part of this. And then little more south, you will have Malabar coast and then Koromandal coast on the eastern side. Then you have Northern Sarkars that is from Vishakapatnam area to the some parts of Odisha and Utkal is the area of Odisha. So these are the names of the, these are the names of the coastal plains and here also you have to understand what are the submergent coast and what are the emergent coast. Okay. There are some emergent coast, this is your emergent, Kutch is your emergent, Katyawar is your submergent coast. Okay. Until Konkan coast, this is all submergent coast. Now come to Malabar, this is emergent coast. You have heard that the Dwaraka is a region that is submerged. Dwaraka is a region that is submerged. Look, Dwaraka is here. This is your submergent coast. Now, across the western coast where the Chellam, plains, Chellam coastal plains are there, coastal erosion have been very much intense. Now, they have come up with a plan to say that very innovative idea which has been in implementation in various parts of the India that is establishment of the tetrapods. Okay. Tetrapods kya hota hai? Tetrapods are nothing but structures of these kinds which will help the stoppage of the erosion that will come onto the land, right. Now there are some hard stoppage methods, there are some soft stoppage methods, what are these methods we will look into in the next couple of minutes. But before this one has to understand few things. Whenever there is an erosion that enters into the coastlines, imagine, imagine this is your coast of India. Okay. Now this coast of India which is having a very broad coastlines, the inundation of water into the interiors of India is nothing new. Now whenever the waves that enter into the coastlines, 
slowly slowly if the erosion is more what happens is that the water that enters into the interior of the land is more now under that condition the ocean water is salt right your ocean water is salt but the water that we use on the continent of in the continent land is usually fresh now if this coastal erosions are very usual it is generally understood that that salt water will enter into the continental land now here just imagine whenever the salt water enters into the fresh waters land the mixing of fresh water and the salt water take place that means our ground water table also will be impacted right along with this imagine you have some crops here crops grown right over a period imagine this this one kilometer stretch of the land where the crops are intensely grown now these crops if salt water if they enter into these areas can this crops tolerate the answer is no so usually it is understood that the coastal areas are usually subjected to the erosions and also the inundation of salt water into fresh water now it is the duty of for us to protect this coastlines why this can create a food security threat this can also create that salt water entering, entering into the land area will where the water ground water table can also be mixed up with the salt water right the chemical composition of the water can be changed right when you dig dig a deep bore well instead of a fresh water there can be a possibility is that salt water can also come out right now these are some of the major challenges and in india because of this particular challenge in india especially many places have been relocated okay now the methods that have been used in the protection of the coastline protection are one of them is the soft let me show you just a minute soft erosion strategies and hard erosion strategies see soft erosion strategies are nothing but those which can be temporary in nature for example maybe the city in mumbai in which one particular area a erosion is taking place in order to protect that erosion what they do is they bring up temporary structures like they put in sandbags or else they put in the levee kind of structures by scraping in the beach so that the water will come and hit this beach and can go back now these are some of the methodologies but these kind of methodologies are not permanent in nature yet temporary features hai every season or every 6 months or so they need to be revamped again investment will be more now there are also structural methods where the permanent measures can be taken that means near about permanent if not permanent near about permanent measures in protecting the coastal erosion before that let us quickly see the images that are associated with the coastal erosion okay see erosion is a natural phenomena there is nothing new in erosion but the rate of erosion at which today it is happening because of the climatic change that is a problem to us and this intense rate of erosion if you look into it can inundate change the landforms that are present on the surface of the earth now imagine there is some kind of settlements next to the coastlines okay maybe 100 years before the beach might have been somewhere here okay but lekin because of erosion the coast has been moved into the interior now what about these people who are living in these areas their life is at a geo parody right so for this there can be steps and methodologies that can be taken to protect the coastal areas so there has been a report in the recent times last couple of year around 2020 make report aaya tha that report said that which is given by the ministry of earth science and they have given an atlas ek atlas diya gaya tha in that atlas it is said that there are areas of intense erosion we have to protect these erosional activities now two bodies are associated with the first body is the national center for coastal research and also indian national center for the ocean information services in cois now these two bodies they have been put forward into the actions to take care of the coastal areas so the national center for the coastal research what it had done is since 1990 it started to map the coastal areas till 2018 and it has given an atlas and this atlas is now being used to identify this erosional activities and take measures now what kind of measures will be taken that measures are your soft methods and hard methods one of the hard methods which have been taken by the chellam area is nothing but the usage of the tetrapods so tetrapods are usually they are put next to the beach area so that this erosion will not happen to the sand 
most of the impact will be taken by this tetrapod suits tetrapods itself so that the land which is present here that can be safeguarded now imagine that these kind of structures if they are placed somewhere next to the landforms of these types can this erosion be stopped yes this kind of erosion if not 100% at least 60 to 70% of the erosion can definitely be controlled right so let us quickly look into this soft and hard methods and what are the methodologies that have been taken into consideration before we take up the soft and hard landings soft and hard erosions right so the incois incois has taken into account how much is the sea level that has been risen and coastal slope kya hai kitna slope hai and it also takes into account the coastal shoreline change rate if the rate is more that means there need to be more amount of tetrapods and hydropods which need to be placed at that particular place right along with this there is coastal geomorphology also taken into consideration and tidal range there can be high tides and low tides especially across the coast of gujarat we have high tides and the coast of the malabar we have low tides so in this high tide regions it is understood that the coast of gujarat is more prone to erosion but to this surprise the report which have been given by the national national incois the center for coastal research said that it is the state of west bengal which had the highest amount of erosions and the state of gujarat so around 600 kilometers of coastline out of this 450 to 500 kilometers of coastline have been eroded now where is the deposition taking place if there is an erosion you have to understand that india's coastline is naturally oriented towards erosion erosional activities and depositional activities with respect to their submergence and emergence so this is your submergent coast this is your emergent coast this is your emergent uh, this is your emergent coast kach region and kathiawar is submergent coast here kach was once considered to be under the sea slowly it started to rise up to the land now the region of dwaraka which is present on the tip of the gujarat kathiawar peninsula it is said that this has been submerged that means there could have been so much of erosion also there could have so much been deposition also so the depositional erosional activities need to be taken into consideration before the settlements that need to be taken place at the coastal area so that's the reason why we will go for these kind of methodologies right now there are some erosional features for the preliminary examination point of view that you also should be aware of the first one is beach see beach is not a depositional feature it is actually an erosional feature right coastal erosional cause theek hai now beaches are temporary in nature imagine it is beaches are temporary in nature your beaches can move forward and your beaches can move backward that is based on the deposition and erosional activities now next comes your sea cliff sea cliff is nothing but a deep steep area which is considered to be as cliff right and marine terraces next to the coastal area if you have terrace kind of structures that is considered to be marine terraces now caves are arches caves and arches are usually erosional activities earlier there could have been a dome and this dome has been eroded slowly the water has washed away the interiors of this dome and which has converted into a cave a similar kind of extreme erosions of the cave can lead to the arch formations also so sea stacks bays and headlands these are some of the coastal erosional features and depositional features right now let's quickly look into the hard erosion control methods theek okay. hai now hard erosion control methods are nothing but those methods where more or less permanent erosion stoppage can be seen at least for 20 to 30 years this is what the understanding which we have right now what are these kind of methods or what kind of methods are used here number 1 it is sea wall theek okay. hai or groins sea wall or groins are nothing but if a series of structures have been put into the ocean these are called your groins similarly sea walls are nothing but if you construct a wall next to the sea that is your sea wall but the life span of the sea wall and the groins is not much usually if you construct a sea wall and along with the sea wall if you also start to deposit the tetrapods then it is considered to be the most effective method in stoppage of the coastal erosion right now it more or less provides a permanent measures now let's look into the average age span or the time span how many years this can stop the erosion so it is said that sea wall is for 50 to 100 years and for groins is 30 to 40 years theek okay. hai now 
see the projects of the project that has been undertaken in the chelam it is also said that there has been a sea wall that has been constructed earlier so either earlier what we used to do is either construct a sea wall or either put some tetrapods but now along with the sea wall there are some tetrapods that have been placed next to the coastal area so that effective erosion can be stopped at least for 50 to 60 years that means the people who are living next to the coastlines it is understood that their life is guaranteed at least the quality of life of these people can be improved now till what height these tetrapods are placed usually the tetrapods are placed until 6 to 7 meters of height so 6 to 7 meters of height is a usual very tall height in india the average tidal height is not more than 2 meters the high tide 3 meters the maximum tide in india where we get at the gujarat coast is hardly 4 meters to 5 meters beyond that we don't have tides so it is one of these methods which we can easily stop the coastal erosion and the other methods for controlling the coastal erosion is your lifeline course lifeline shorelines or which are also called as living shorelines now what are these living shorelines see living shorelines are nothing but if at all instead of constructing a sea wall what you can do is you start to grow vegetation across the coastlines now this growing of the vegetation if you look into the coastlines of Sundarbans and post tsunami in 2004 Indian government has intensively started to plant mangroves across the coastlines starting from Gujarat starting from Gujarat to Kolkata you name a state there is no state today that do not have this mangrove plantations so mangrove plantations are one of the best examples for the living shores which are present in India now these living shores can be easily protecting with respect to the conservation of bio biological diversity and also the marine biodiversity so it is best understood that instead of going for intensive constructions or tetrapods you can also go for living shorelines one of the examples of the living shorelines are your Pichavaram mangrove forest or Sundarban mangrove forest your Gujarat coastline mangrove forest these are your living shores and in this living shores the ecosystem ecological value is very very high okay this is one of the methodology where you can go and if all of this fail if all of this fails there is another method simply move out from that place and go out to a different place in India especially the coastlines of the Gujarat there has been times when the coastal erosion has been intense and the people from there has to be located to a different place so the last remedial methodology is the relocation you completely need to relocate that is the only solution right so if at all there is a rise in the sea level can you name which continent is the continent which is going to face the brunt of sea level first is it Asia Europe North America South America please comment in your comment sections see usually it is Europe the average height of the Europe is not more than two to three meters if at all the rise of sea level is more than one and a half meter it is Europe 30 to 40 percent of the Europe it will be inundated the water gets inundated into the Europe so Europe has sizable amount of population so these are some of the steps which we can take forward to control the erosions of the sea right and next next article which talks about is the essential commodities act invoked to rein into turdal price agar aap dekhte ho, if you have been into cooking you would understand that turdal price has almost doubled in the last six months and now a particular act has come into effect and this turdal is put into that act that is your essential commodities act see essential commodities act is an age old act which has been enacted in the year 1955 which said that if at all a particular products price is increased almost by double then this act comes into picture and says that jitne bhi whatever the turdal that is present in the market or whatever the turdal that is present in the godowns there puts a limit that means in your godowns you are not supposed to store beyond a particular limit of this particular product right now this is what is the essential commodities act in this we have clearly discussed this act many number of times in the previous classes and also we have also discussed in detail regarding the eco sensitive zones and now there has also been small amendments which have been pushing in the eco sensitive zones with respect to the 44a and 44e sections so whenever the clarity is there in the newspapers with respect to 44a and 44e we will be taking up that but essential commodities act also we have taken it many number of times 
So I will not be spending much time here. I will be providing you a link in the description where you can look forward for this act. Right. Now in this Essential Commodities Act, I will give an overview. See Essential Commodities Act says that, that 1955 may a act banata and this act says that if at all a particular products price, if it is 2x doubles, then it can be because of two different reasons. One, there is inflation in the market. Tike? There is inflation in the market. Two, all the traders who are dealing with this product, they might have stored this product in their go downs. Tike? Unki kutki go downs mein store karke, only certain amount of product is left into the market. Now, small amounts of products when they are left into the market, there are more number of people who will be willing to buy this. So there is more demand and the less product availability. Under this conditions also the price can rise. Now it is understood that it is understood and considered that the Turdal price is high because of the CPI inflation, inflation also which is at 7% and also because of storage of this Turdal in the markets. Currently the government is having somewhere around 39 lakh tons of Turdal in the go-downs. Now the government said that we are going to release this. No longer this Turdal is allowed to store in your go-downs beyond a particular limit. Right. Now it has to come into the market. When this product comes into the market, the within the market, the quantity of the product will be more and now the price will come down automatically in a matter of time. Now this is the role of the Essential Commodities Act. If you go back and look into, it is this act which played a major role even in the Farmers Bill also. Okay. Farmers Bill, it is said that they are going to scrap this Essential Commodities Act completely. Okay. Government is Government figures into this Essential Commodities, Commodities Act only when the inflation is high and when the product price is more than 50, 50% 50 of the total price in the matter of just 2 months or 3 months. So that we have discussed in the Farms Bill earlier also. This is what it for today and thank you guys. If you have any doubts, please post in the comment section. We will be addressing those doubts and also please make sure to utilize the Seize the Mains program where the questions for these topics which have been discussed will be provided in the link description below. It is not important to learn, it is also important to write to write whatever you have learned. So take this opportunity to get your answer evaluated by our experts. So seize the mains link will be provided in the description below. Thank you guys.